save some time and actually do some uh, heavy lifting work in class. So at this point, you should be taking your notes out, your uh, something to write on, a Google Doc, anything that's going to allow you to take notes uh, as these are technically lecture notes, so they will be quizzable and accessible. So as soon as it starts. So when were the Middle Ages? The Middle Ages lasted about a thousand years, from about 500 AD to 1500 AD. All right, so this is really the era that falls in between the ancient era and the modern era. Okay, this is a specific European time, um, and really we see a lot of fractured people, a lot of sad things, a lot of disturbing things. Um, the idea of a central government really falls apart after the Roman Empire collapses. Um, people are experiencing anarchy, they're on their own, there's really no large government or army or system even to protect them. Um, once the Roman Empire falls due to mostly uh, uh, quote unquote barbarian invasions from the Goths, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, um, the Roman Empire is going to fall, people are going to have no one to protect them, and they're going to be terrified. So this is a map of uh, the old Roman Empire. Um, this is at its height all of the territories that um, the Romans controlled. Um, if you look to the right of the map, you can see the Byzantine Empire. Remember, this is uh, the empire that the Ottomans are going to attack and cause the pretty much the final coffin nail in the Byzantine Empire. So we're starting to see things uh, intersect and connect in our studies. Um, but at the beginning of the Middle Ages, the Byzantine Empire is really going to uh, do its own thing. And so they'd be known as the Eastern Empire, the Byzantine Empire. But what we're going to focus on and what we're going to be looking at for the next couple of weeks is the Western section of Europe. After the fall of the Western Roman Empire, things go crazy. Do you see all these different territories? Different groups of people like the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Gauls, the Vandals, the Slavs, the Saxons, the Hutes, all of these different people are going to claim territory. They're all going to try to fill that vacuum of power. But of course, things are going to fall apart quickly because these empires and kingdoms were unstable from the very beginning. They were absorbing new peoples and really they were not equipped with the proper administration uh, like the Roman Empire had to deal and govern uh, effectively. So the answer to this issue was feudalism. Feudalism in Europe is really the main um, way for Europeans to feel safe. I apologize for the um, fire engines in the background. Of course, it starts now. Um, but the uh, feudalist system really provides protection for the common people. During this time, the Vikings, yes, the Vikings, Valhalla, the great warriors, that's what I'm talking about. Um, not the football team, weird joke, but whatever. The Vikings uh, and other barbarians are going to be really sweeping through Europe, um, but the Vikings specifically are going to be on the coast. They're going to be raiding and burning cities and villages. Uh, they're going to destroy a lot of church property, and they're going to strike terror and fear in the hearts of the Europeans. So... We didn't have a standing army. We didn't have a Roman empire to protect us like we used to have. The people begin to look to the nobles, the people who have the money, the people who have the power, the people who have an army, even if it might be small. They look to the nobles to protect them. We talked about what feudalism looked like in Japan, but in Europe, it's a fear-based thing. Whereas the Japanese had hundreds of years of feudalism um, prior to the beginning of the Middle Ages, the Europeans largely adapt this system and adopt the system as a reaction to the invasions and the constant fighting. Um, feudalism, of course, as we know, was land-based, loyalty-based, um, but unlike uh, the Japanese system, uh, we're going to see knights that are born into the nobility who are going to uh, live by the code of chivalry. They'll live in castles, they'll be fighting off these uh, so-called barbarians. They'll be very strong people, um, and they'll be living it up 
with the nobles while the peasants are living in squalor. And one more note about feudalism and its impact on the overall time period. Uh, we're going to start seeing the rise of major cities that we know today, such as Paris, such as uh, London, Zurich, uh, uh, Moscow, um, and other smaller, well, well, once were smaller states, um, except for Rome. Rome is going to continue to burn for a couple hundred years and not really be able to recover. So here's your official definition. Um, this is a little bit different than the one from Japan. Same exact idea, a system of organizing society and around land and ownership and loyalty. A few people owned the land and offered protection in return for loyalty. And really, as we move through the Middle Ages, we're going to start to see a transition. Remember, the big issue in Japan was that these local daimyos or nobles became too powerful. They were more powerful than the emperor and the shogun. Same thing's going to happen in Europe. The nobles are going to be more powerful than the self-proclaimed kings. But as we go on, the kings are going to start taking back their power. There's going to be a decline in feudalism and a development of a system where we have centralized government that's going to allow for the uh, development and beginning of the Renaissance. All right, we know what these trying what this pyramid looks like. Um, the only difference is that um, above the king would really be the pope and the church. Okay, because in, you know, we know that uh, the pope's largest and most significant power was that they were able to excommunicate, which meant they were able to kick you out of the church, which meant that you would be going to hell. It was pretty much a sure way for you to be excluded from heaven and spend an eternity on fire and in pain. So the Pope was above everyone. The church was extremely powerful. And so a simpler way to think about feudalism in Europe is the lords own the land. Okay, They lived in a manor house or castle. Um, the knights or vassals uh, were given land for loyalty. They protected the lords and their land. Um, they were much like the samurai, but um, a bit stronger. Um, and then we get to the bottom level, which is uh, the peasantry or the serfs. They were poor people who were tied to the land and worked for the land. Remember, we talked about how in this time, most people never in their lifetime traveled more than two miles from their house. That's crazy. They spent their entire lives in one town. So then we get to the castles, all right? Some, sometimes they would be small enough where you could consider the manors. Um, sometimes they would be castles. The main idea of the castle was to protect the people, all right? We see the keep up here, this area. The keep is going to be where all of the people run in the town. So this would be surrounded by a village. The people would run up through the barbar uh, excuse me, barbican. They would go over the drawbridge, go through the lower bailey, go into the keep and stay and hide in there. The keep could be a tower, the keep could be deep underground, um, but this was a place to hold the people to protect them while the armies fought for them. Right? It was a means to protect. It was not just a glamour thing. And so we get to the manor system. The manor system is a political, economic, and social system by which the peasants of medieval Europe were rendered dependent on their land and on their lord. So the idea being the manor or the castle would be at the top of a hill or would be in a central position or uh, in a very st strategically sound location and would really look over the village, right? The serfs' houses, the churches, the mills, the workshops, the bakeries, the fields. Um, but it was always close enough and there was always a direct path from the town so that you could go and hide in the castle. So the manor system is something we need to know. It also talks about how uh, when you are cultivating land, you need to rotate your land. The more uh, you farm on that particular plot of soil, the less minerals and nutrients are going to be present. And therefore, your food won't be as uh, nutritious and you will not yield as many things. So by rotating crops and crop locations, we're going to have better minerals and more responsible farming. Then we get to the church. Uh, the kings and popes had a powerful effect on the lives of the medieval people. But of course, as we know, in the medieval times, the pope is really going to be all powerful. He had the ability to call on all of the European powers and order them to, uh, you know, through the Crusades, five different times, by the way, charge into the Middle East and try to take back Jerusalem. 
But overall, kings and popes had a very powerful effect on people. Religion was also a big way of controlling people, a way that people run to or try to reason with the horrible things that are happening in their lives is through religion. Ah, my child died of cholera. It must be God's will. Okay, it's not just random. Um, my wife died of a disease. Uh, it must be uh, God's will. And sh this is also a way to find comfort because she's in heaven now. All right, so the Catholic Church is very powerful. They become almost a governmental system. They become very land rich, very wealthy, very powerful, very influential politically. And the popes are going to have a lot of say over what the kings and queens do. The church and governments are also going to support the arts, uh, which is contrary to what you usually hear. Now, no, by, when I say um, they supported different ways of learning, that does not mean they supported science. It means they supported different ways of learning through um, the church, different ways of learning about the Bible, um, such as through stained glass windows in the churches. People in the Middle Ages could not read, so they saw pictures in the stained glass to kind of teach them the stories. They had other purposes too, but we will not go through them. So then we get to the late little, late Middle Ages. Um, we talk about the Black Plague, uh, the Black Death, the Bubonic Plague. All of these things are um, indicative of this time and have a major impact on the people. In Western Europe, we're going to see a lot of war. Uh, we are going to see um, England and France at each other's throats. Then we're going to see Spain and Portugal fighting off the Muslims in Spain. And it's going to be a couple hundred years of constant warfare. And so these are going to act as traumas. There were a few significant, a few significant events and factors that led to a shift in thinking of, in society, which led us to the Renaissance. The Black Death killed off about two thirds of all of Europe. So two thirds of the European population died, their bodies rotten. Like, just think about that. No other event in history has um, really caused the deaths of two thirds of a continental population. This is insane. So people start moving away. They start moving to cities out of the country where there were more opportunities for jobs, uh, more safety. If you're in a city, you're less likely to be assaulted by a gang of bandits uh, and or you're able to get help quicker um, in a city than you are in the rural lands. And there were less knights to defend the nobles. Okay, Kings would gain more power because of the Black Death, because of um, the fall of feudalism, because of um, the decline of the church. Uh, these kings and knights are going to gain more notoriety. They're going to get more power, centralize their power. Many knights died from, the, from disease and um, from the Black Death and from the Crusades. So there's less, just like with Japan, less of a need for knights. Okay, the samurai, when there were less of them, the, no the nobles had less power, the daimyos had less power. Same thing in Europe. Okay, and this is really when we're going to start to see um, armies of regular people start developing. We had this um, under the Roman Empire, but this kind of fizzled out when there was no central uh, government to maintain an army. And so this is a, a neat little video. I hope it plays. And what it's going to do is it's going to show you, oh, of course it stopped. <laughs> this is going to show you how quickly um, the plague is going to spread. Um, and how fast the disease moved. It will start to go quicker, don't worry. So we're not seeing a lot of movement, right? It's still very early on. Suddenly it starts spreading in the Middle East and around the Mediterranean. Goes off for a little bit, still some hot spots, but really not affecting Europe yet. Try to 
to speed this up. <laughs> Once we get to the 1300s, we're really going to start seeing the plague in Europe. Here we go. Spreading in Asia. And just like that, it spreads like wildfire. All right, it's all the way across the continent. It spreads so quickly in the Middle East, all throughout Europe. Okay, as slow as the map had been moving for the past hundred or so years, suddenly all of Europe is infected. Okay, most of the Middle East is infected and Asia is infected. So from that map, we can see how much of an impact the disease would have on people. Then we get to the Hundred Years War. So this is part two the devastation we see from a war that lasted 100 years. It actually was divided into three different parts, um, but it started when the French king, Charles IV, died in 1328. Uh, he had no child, no male heir. Um, and it's important to know that at this time and for the foreseeable future, we're going to see um, a lot of royalty be connected and related. Um, so two men would claim uh, to be the heir to the throne or the next line, a person in succession. Edward III of England, who is the son-in-law of Charles IV, would claim the throne. But Philip of, Philip of uh, Valois, um, who was the nephew of Charles, would also claim the throne. So there would be war. The English attacked the French. Fighting ensued. They're fighting on and off for a hundred years. The war ends. And there's a territorial switch. Bordeaux, which had been held by the English for hundreds of years, uh, was suddenly uh, taken over as they surrendered to the French. Um, and Calais would be taken by the English. All right, so there'd be a swapping of possessions. It's important to note that no one wins. It's just prolonged fighting. It's just stalemate. New weapons were introduced in this time, such as the longbow, the average man could serve in the army, not just the knights who trained their whole lives. Kings gained more power. England lost territory in France. And there was a massive change in social structure. The feudal system begins to disintegrate. People are saying this is not working. The kings and queens need more power so we can have centralized armies. Okay, so we can see the trade difference in... Um, uh, 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 town life um, and how much people start trading, uh, where the importance lies. So we have the church versus um, the government. Um, so religious versus secular. We can see the development of cities. And we see the rise of city states. A, city, a city state is a city with its surrounding territory form, uh, which forms an independent state. So basically a city that is basically its own country, right? A city state is very powerful. It has influence around it, but the city is the capital and the surrounding area. City state is power. So the Renaissance real quick before we finish up, the Renaissance is a French word meaning rebirth. Uh, it was a real revival of the arts and learning. Um, the period when scholars became interested in ancient Greek and Roman culture. Italians were surrounded by their ancient culture and artifacts, so the Renaissance is really going to begin in Italy. The Italian city-states also displayed their wealth by giving financial support to artists who created works with classical themes. So the Renaissance, it's going to start in Italy. The Black Death is pretty much over at this point. Italy has a warmer climate, so people are able to recover quicker. So the Renaissance is going to spread north, uh, north as the plague starts dying out, right? It's going, you're going to be healthier where it's warmer. You're going to be less prone to disease than where it's colder. And so people were really fascinated with classical cultures, and we'll get into this more next week. Um, the Greeks, the Romans, uh, they start looking back to the ancient times as the ideal time. There's a belief in uh, human potential, which we'll see from the sources. Um, there's a new type of scholar called the humanist centered on humanity. It's centered on human worthiness, not just um, religion. 
And humanists devoted themselves to studying ancient writings, learning many subjects like Greek, Latin, uh, and history and math. And that is the end of our video. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. Please take notes. If you missed anything, the great thing about a video is that you can rewind. You can fill in whatever you missed. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this. Remember to make your two, two to three comments or questions so we can discuss this video in class um, uh, when we see each other next. Um, if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Uh, but until then, keep enjoying history. Peace.